That's okay. She's not in here yet. You can. <laughs> if we could uh, take our seats, please. I am sorry we are running late, but I'm not sorry for the enthusiasm uh, for Dr. Constantino's book and her willingness and generosity uh, of patience to sign them. So thank you all f uh, for your patience. There we go. If we could all come in and take a seat. And we can go ahead, yeah, we'll go ahead and close the doors. Dr. Evgenia Costantino holds six degrees, five degrees in theology, including her Master's of Theology degree from Holy Cross Greek Orthodox School of Theology and from Harvard Divinity School, specializing in New Testament and early Christianity. Her doctorate degree is from the Université Laval, where she wrote her doctoral dissertation on the apocalypse in the ancient church of the East. She also holds a Juris Doctorate degree in 1985 from Pepperdine University School of Law and worked as a practicing attorney in her previous life. Dr. Constantino has been teaching biblical studies and early Christianity in graduate schools of theology and universities for decades. She's well known as Dr. Jeannie in the Orthodox world and hosts a weekly internet Bible study podcast, Search the Scriptures Live on Ancient Faith Radio. She is also the author of numerous articles and four books. Her most recent book, which combines her knowledge of the New Testament, Roman law and culture, first century Judaism, and early Christianity, is, as I think we're all well aware, The Crucifixion of the King of Glory, The Amazing History and Sublime Mysteries of the Passion, published by Ancient Faith Press in 2022. Her live podcasts and recordings can be found at Ancient Faith Radio. She's also the author of numerous articles and, and two other books published by Catholic University of the American Press, Guiding to a Blessed End, Andrew of Casaria and the Apocalypse Commentary in the Ancient Church, published in 2013, and her commentary on the Apocalypse by Andrew of Casaria, published in 2012. So that's the formal introduction. Now for the real one. She's awesome. <laughs> She's a scholar, an author, a presenter, a writer, a presbytera. We all love Father Costa, her husband. And um, she's quite busy. And it was a wonderful blessing last year when Father Constantine Zozos, um, up north in, in uh, Pocatello, um, floated the idea that our two parishes uh, bring her to town. And um, again, not, not easy for her, a lot of travel both today and tonight, and then following her full um, presentation tomorrow in, uh, in Pocatello. I should say that if anyone is going to be traveling uh, tonight um, to the Assumption Parish uh, for her presentations tomorrow, uh, their schedule is as follows, 9.30 to 10 is their continental breakfast. Her first session will be from 10 to 12. Lunch will be from 12 to 1. There will be an activity with youth. Uh, a second session from 1.30 to 3.30 and uh, Vespers and final remarks there. So we are very blessed uh, to have her with us on this evening. And uh, if we can please have a very a warm round and a welcome for Dr. Jeannie Constantino. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. You want to take your phone? There you go. See all, otherwise, I'll see all your secrets. They thought I had thank you, memorized. Father. I know. I know. Um, thank you, everybody. It's so, such a pleasure to be here and um, experience the enthusiasm of this young parish to see what you have accomplished in such a short period of time. You have a sister parish in Flemington, New Jersey, that's also St. Anna, and uh, I was just there last week, okay, so, so, and they're very, very similar, very enthusiastic, lots of life, and very dynamic parish, and so it's such a pleasure to be with you. Since Father mentioned the Pocatello presentations, 
I, I want to remind you that if you do come up tomorrow, that is not going to be at the church, but at the Promise Center on Main Street in Pocatello. I think it's called the Promise Center. Does that sound familiar? But anyhow, it's not at the church, okay? So don't go to the church and then say, where did everybody go? They all ditched me, you know? <laughs> so we're not doing that. So we have... Oh, the Purpose Center. That, that's it. I knew it was a funny name. It's the Purpose Center. Think of the purpose. What is my purpose? And you go to the Purpose Center. So go to the Purpose Center. Very good. So, Father, thank you so much for inviting me to all the clergy here, everybody in the parish, for your very, very warm welcome. Um, and for being so patient while I signed everyone's book. We don't have a lot of time this evening. Tomorrow is when most of the presentation will take place, so I wasn't quite sure what sort of notes to hit with you. Um, and so because of that, I'm going to get right to the point and be kind of direct because... Um, you know, we're going to, I'm going to be talking about Orthodox Christianity at least, uh, you know, as much as I can this evening. And I want to be very direct, as I said, and not have people feel offended. Well, you know, I'm in an Orthodox church. I'm talking about the Orthodox church, and I'm an Orthodox Christian. I shouldn't have to apologize for that. I'm not apologizing for it. But definitely what happens is sometimes when you draw out distinctions between different faiths, People are quick to say, well, are you saying you're better than the rest of us? Why are you trashing or bashing or whatever they think we're doing of other faiths? It's not that we are claiming as individuals that we're better than other people. That's actually not orthodox at all, but our church definitely is, <laughs> okay? And I'm here to tell you why, okay? So I'm, I'm not apologizing for that stance, okay? It's not that we're so great, you know, in terms of our persons, but, but our church is the apostolic faith. It is the ancient apostolic faith. And I know everybody says that, but we can back it up. Okay, that's why we're, I'm here to talk about this. So, you know, um, why be orthodox? Why be orthodox? Um, I think it's important for us to identify why we're orthodox, to be orthodox, not because we're Greek, but because we believe that this is the true faith. And I don't think we should apologize for that or um, be timid about saying so. We should proclaim it with confidence, not with arrogance, but with confidence. Not what we believe, but what we know to be true. Now, for some of us who are older, we might remember back in sort of like the 70s when everybody was like in the I'm okay, you're okay era, you know, remember that? So this is when our society, I think, became very watered down. People used to express themselves and say, I think this. And then in the 70s, they were like, well, I feel like maybe we should vote on this. They just, everybody was so timid and everything was about your feelings. Well, you know, this is why today, even though we're surrounded by so much nonsense, we're like afraid to say anything about it. And, and we have got to begin to speak the truth with real conviction and boldness. This is a biblical value, parisia, boldness. We have boldness before Christ. That's not like brashness. That's not like rudeness. But boldness means that we can speak with confidence, knowing who we are. That's what that word is about. So when, Christ, when Paul says we have boldness for Christ, that is the word he uses. Now, we don't want to offend people, but, you know, let them get over it. If we, seriously, just say it, as long as we are, I'm not saying we should be brash, as I said, not arrogant, not, you know, condescending toward others. No, because of anybody, of all the churches, we know that we, we don't claim our salvation. Other people do. I think everybody else does, except for us. Everybody says, well, this is the formula, what you need to do to be saved. We're the only ones who don't do that because we're very mindful of the fact that we're fallen and that we're sinful. So it doesn't matter if other people take offense. They'll get over it, okay? But we have to speak 
Okay, because here's why. The culture is so coarse. Even here in Utah, where people are pretty conservative, you're not spared. You're not spared from any of the nonsense that we see in the culture. And our young people are exposed to virtually everything. Everything crude. And yet, we're afraid of offending somebody by talking about Jesus Christ or the Orthodox Church. We need to get over it. We just need to get over it. So, as I said, you know, everybody else is claiming their salvation. The Protestants will say, this is what you need to do to be saved, X, Y, Z. Do this and you go to heaven. And then the Catholics, of course, especially the traditional Catholics, you've got to be in union with Rome, and Rome is it, you know. And it's, it's quite amazing to me, um, listening to Catholics, I don't think there are Catholics that are happy with their church. They're all unhappy with their church. I've never heard anybody says, we love our church. They love their church. Don't get me wrong. They love their church. I've had a lot of Catholic students. They love their church. They're devoted to their church. But everybody is looking for it to change somehow. Okay? We don't do that. I'm going to come back to that. But I want you to understand that they have this idea that even though there's something wrong with their church, they're sticking with it by golly because it's Rome. And you have to be in union with Rome. So we don't believe that we can guarantee our salvation or our salvation can, can be guaranteed by anything we do. Catholics will tell you exactly what you need to do to be saved. Protestants all have their thing that you need to do to be saved. And Jehovah's Witnesses and Mormons, and they all have something. Now, we don't do that because Christ saves and Christ judges, not us. Now, because of this, that doesn't mean that we're all alike, that we're all the same, that being Orthodox doesn't matter. Of course it matters. It's your best chance, your best chance at salvation. And we need to encourage people to explore the church, to know their faith, and just be willing to talk about it. Not, again, in a preachy way, although I have to say, I have to say, the Protestants, God bless them, they're not afraid to talk about Jesus Christ, and, and they're right to do so, but there's something about their presentation, and it's this. Um, do you know Christ? Are you saved? And the implication is, I'm saved, you're not saved. That's the implication. But why can't we talk about Jesus Christ without that? And just invite people to the church. Do you know how many Orthodox Christians have become Orthodox because somebody just invited them to church and they came into the church because they, they've never heard of it. They don't know anything about it. So this is why it's quite incumbent on us who are Orthodox to simply talk about the church in a natural way as part of your life. And Easter is the best time to do it because we're going to be so late. We're a month after everybody else, right? So... That's going to be so strange for them. Don't forget Monday. Get your Easter candy. 50% off. Okay? Now, especially, do you have C's candy? Do you have C's candy here? Do you have C's? Oh, my God. The best. I had to, I stopped going because father's diabetic, and you could see that. I can't, don't need that stuff either. And now that Christopher has grown up, he says, Mom, you have to stop buying the candy. But it's hard to resist, right? And it's 50% off. 50% off. The best, the best thing about Greek Easter is the candy. 50% off. I love it. So, anyhow, where was I? Um, I mean, mentioning, yeah, the, that was not my main point, so candy. <laughs> but you can see where my mind is. But the, the point is, you, you're going to be saying, well, I'm, you know, we got my Easter baskets ready, or we're going to church for Holy Week. Or, oh, what do you mean Easter? This is your chance to say, yes, we follow the ancient apostolic church. Just mention it. Just talk about it. Just let people know that we exist. Again, not in an argumentative way, not as presenting ourselves as something superior, but just let people know that the church exists. And then talk about it with joy and enthusiasm, which is what I experienced earlier when I was in there signing books. How many people told me how much they love this parish, how wonderful it is. And so this kind of enthusiasm that you have 
is so important um, because that alone is so persuasive, so persuasive. It's, it's the way you speak about your faith and your church and Jesus Christ that really draws people to the faith. So I'm a lawyer and I'll tell you that there is nothing so persuasive as a person who really believes in what they are saying. I, I wasn't, we don't have a lot of time, but I'll tell you a little story from my life as a lawyer. Um, and for those of you, there, is a, there are a couple of us, I think, in the room who are, who are attorneys. I had a case in which a woman was working, she was, this, was in the, this was in the 80s, she was a stockbroker, and she um, was working for E.F. Hutton in Beverly Hills very successful stockbroker, and she was wooed away to Prudential Beige by these other guys, and they hired her, and so she, she was making a lot of money in the 1980s. And her boss started coming on to her. This was before the Me Too sexual harassment thing was really big, and people you know, didn't really take it all that seriously. Well, she refused to go along with him, and he made sure that she lost her clients and put her in a tiny office, with, literally with a pole in the middle of it, and uh, all these other things happened to her. She lost her job, she lost her house, she lost her car, she lost everything. Now, this poor woman couldn't get a lawyer to help her because nobody would take her case because she didn't have any money, okay? So I, it's, it's kind of a long story how I got involved in this case, but I took on the case. Meanwhile, this poor woman, there were, she had filed papers, but she didn't know how to follow through on those papers. And she was writing, people would file, you know, Prudential Base was filing a response. She didn't know what to do with this legal mumbo jumbo. So she would just write a letter to the judge explaining herself. This is, doesn't work in court. You have to do things in a proper way. So her case got, her case got dismissed on both state court and federal court, and it was dismissed with prejudice. Now what that means in the law is, is it's dead. It can never be revived. You can dismiss without prejudice, that means you can come back and try again. This was dismissed with prejudice. So in other words, if it was a body, it was in the morgue. Okay, I mean, gone. Now, she had a right to have her case be heard um, on, uh, through arbitration, but she had to go through a certain process. So anyhow, I, I got this case, and um, we, I, we, I tried to revive it. I went to court to argue that because of the great injustice that she suffered, and because she was all alone, and there's this huge company opposing her, there was just no chance for her to get any justice. So here's what happens when you are making a motion. I brought a motion to revive this case, okay, which was dead as dead can be. And so when you go to court, you go to a special room that's called law and motion. And then there's this bulletin, there's like a clipboard there that says all the cases, and then how the judge is inclined to rule because he's already ruled, he's already decided. He read the papers, he's pretty much already decided, but he still lets you make your argument. So the ruling was against us because the law was against us and the facts were against us. She didn't follow through with the filings. She, she's, she, it's dead, the case is dead. Well, I got in there and I argued so passionately, he changed his mind. The case came alive again. It's, I, you know, it's like bringing somebody back from the dead. It's like unheard of, okay? But I'm telling you that the other party, other counsel came there figuring, for, you know, I don't even have to prepare because there's no way this is going to be revived. It was dismissed with prejudice. And he really wasn't prepared and he just kind of gave his arguments. It was kind of like this. And I was like, but your honor, my client, da 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 da. This is unfair. She suffered this great injustice. She deserves to have her day in court. She's, and I went on. And why? I really believe that when we speak about something with conviction, it is very persuasive. 
And so when we talk about Christ, when we talk about the Orthodox Church, let's talk about it like we really believe it, like we really mean it, like we're here for a reason, and not just give an answer to give an answer. Now, again, I'm not saying that we're saying this in a, a um, triumphalistic manner, but let us speak the truth with conviction. We owe it to Christ to speak the truth about him and his church. We owe it to Christ, who endured the cross for us. And you know, when we're reluctant to speak up and say, you know what, that's not right, that's not true, and just to say the truth, whatever it is that you know, whatever it is that you can... Not that all of us are experts. Whatever you know to be true, whatever you can contribute, is something worth saying. I'm not telling you to go out and tell other people how to live or what to do. But if you know something to be true, say it. Um, a few months ago, I was doing an online course for a Catholic group. And there was a question and answer session at the very end, and a woman uh, we were talking about Jesus, and this woman said that both, she says, isn't it wonderful that both the Jews and the Muslims accept Jesus as a prophet? And I said, that's not true. The Jews do not, they respect Jesus. They all respect Jesus. It is part of this pablum that we have in our society. We all believe the same thing, don't have any negative opinion about anybody or anything else. And I said, that's not true. The Muslims, yes, they have him as a prophet not as the son of God, even though he's born of a virgin. Did you know that? The Muslims believe he's born of a virgin. Well, who, who, who has a virgin birth? Okay, but he's just a prophet for them. But for the Jews, they don't regard Jesus as a prophet. Is a false prophet, maybe, but not. She was arguing with me. But I, I couldn't just let that stand. And so... We, I said it again, and I said it politely, but when we hear something that is not true, we must respond, okay? Because we're standing for Christ. Now, sometimes we say, well, you know, I don't want to hurt somebody's feelings. Well, that's, that's an excuse. That is an excuse. That's how we excuse ourselves. And the reason is because we don't want people to think ill of us. We want everybody to like us. We want the approval of men more than the approval of God. Okay? That's what it comes down to. Now, that doesn't mean that you're, again, you're in your face with somebody, you're combative. I'm not advocating that. I'm just saying, say the simple truth. But let the truth be told. Let it be said. Because we can water down the gospel. Because we don't want anybody not to like us. Oh, there's, she's got some kind of religious nut. She thinks she's better. Let them say what they will. That doesn't matter. This, we have to have the courage to talk about Christ, invite people to the church, because what has happened is that our culture, which used to be a Christian culture, now wants to make Jesus over into its own image. We're supposed to become his image, but the culture wants to tell us who Jesus Christ is. Have you seen these ads he gets us, Jesus, or somebody washing feet. Have you seen this? It was on the Super Bowl. I've seen a couple of big billboards, and it's some, two random people, somebody's washing somebody else's feet in like a modern setting. And it's about Jesus gets us. He washed feet. And I'm thinking, what the heck is that? What is that trying to say? Just, Jesus didn't go around randomly washing people's feet. Oh, nice to meet you. How about if I wash your feet? He washed the disciples' feet. We know why he did that. It was in his example of humility. What does it mean that he gets us? It's like everybody's the same. We're all here to just serve each other. Let's not say the truth about Jesus Christ, that he asked people to repent. He called them to repentance because our culture has made Jesus into what I like to call the harmless hippie. That's what he is, the harmless hippie. Hippie, long hair, the long robe, and it's okay, peace and love, God loves you, God loves everybody, don't worry about it, you're fine the way you are. That's what our country is giving us as Jesus Christ, and he was anything but that. And don't think that he didn't call people to account. When it was time to be, to be loving and merciful, he was with people who repented. But when people confronted him and when people were arrogant, and, and proud, 
He didn't tolerate that. So th we have to recognize that the Lord offended people, and he wasn't afraid to offend people. He was the rock of offense, the stumbling block, the scandal. His teachings scandalized people. He knew that people would be ashamed of him. And this is what he said. He said, if anyone is ashamed of me in this adulterous and sinful generation of him, will the Son of Man be ashamed when he returns in glory with the angels, with the, with the holy angels? So when he said, you have to pick up your cross, because you know the cross was a great scandal. So you have to pick up your cross and follow me. This is what he meant. You have to be willing to be a scandal. You have to be willing to leave it all on the line. You have to be willing to imitate him. Picking up your cross and following Christ is not dealing with the difficulties of life. That's what people like to say. Oh, we all have our cross to bear. You know, you have an illness and this person lost their job and this person had a death to go. No, no, that's not the cross because then everybody in the world would be a Christian, right? Because everybody has difficulties in life. Everybody has challenges. To pick up your cross is to imitate Christ completely. So we, I, I'm trying to, this is a, it's a requirement of discipleship. If anyone would be my disciple, let him do this. We have to be willing to imitate him to the death and to be a scandal for, for what is right and what is true. So I'm, I'm trying to encourage you in this because it matters. Again, I'm not insisting that we combat people. I certainly don't want you to be on the internet arguing with people. Please don't do that. There's too much of that. But when you see a person, when a person says something that is not correct, politely respond. Okay? If, they don't, or if somebody asks you about your faith, explain it. Don't argue with people who are not willing to, to listen. That's something else. We have to have discernment. Sometimes people want to goad us into having an argument with them. The Lord didn't always answer the scribes and the Pharisees and the Sadducees. He didn't always do that. Sometimes he left them alone. He didn't answer their question, right? By what authority do you do these things? And he said, I'll ask you a question. If you answer me, I'll answer you. And then he didn't answer them, right? Because they were afraid to answer. So there are many times when he says, he says, give us a sign from heaven. And he says, I'm not going to give you a sign. You're demanding it, I'm not going to give you that sign. So there were times when he refused to play their game. And then there were other times when he has a long conversation with somebody, like the Samaritan woman, a woman and a Samaritan, because she was open. So when we see that somebody really is interested, well, that doesn't mean they want to become Orthodox, but they want to learn more about Orthodox Christianity, about the ancient church, then let's speak to them. But when we see that a person is just argumentative or combative, we walk away. We're not there to try to bash people over the head and kind of convince them by our words. Because you know why? That's not what convinces them. Our words are not enough. We should speak up, but I want you to think about those very first Christians. What convinced people to join the church to, when the church was being persecuted? It was the way of life of those Christians that made such an impression on people. They were impressed with how those first believers lived. There was a way of life that they followed. They had a life of virtue. They lived in a way that was different from everybody else, and it was genuine. They weren't putting on airs. They weren't pretending. They just lived a life of virtue. And in the Greco-Roman world, people really believed you couldn't be virtuous unless you studied philosophy. Philosophy was where people learned about virtue. Temperance and modesty and justice and patience and, and prudence and, you know, generosity, all of those virtues, you learn that by studying philosophy. And here were these people, children, old ladies, you know, slaves, and they were behaving in a philosophical way. And people were impressed by this. They were feeding the poor, they were loving their neighbors, they were taking care of strangers. So it was how they lived. They didn't stand on the street corner passing out pamphlets. It was the way they lived in society that made an impression on people. And then it was the way they died. Because when they went into the arenas, in the arena, to be 
martyred, they died cheerfully. They were not afraid of death because they had experienced Jesus Christ. And they died bravely, especially the women who were said, wow, these, these women are they're so brave and they were being tortured, but they didn't care. They died forgiving their persecutors. I read a book once that said, oh, those Christians, when they were being killed by the Romans, they were probably cursing them. No, they weren't. Actually, the accounts of martyrdom say that they were worried about the persecutors, or they were telling them, I forgive you, but you have to repent. The gods you're worshiping are false gods. They're not true. You're worshiping demons. Your, your, idol, your idolatry is the work of demons. But they didn't curse them. They felt sorry for them. So seeing these people subjected to the worst tortures in the arena, the other Romans who had gone there for entertainment were amazed. So this is how people came to Christ, okay? Because there was no YouTube, right? All right, no YouTube, no uh, mass media, no radio shows, no podcasts, nothing like this. People were impressed. So what does it mean to be orthodox? How did those first people know how to live that life I'm talking about? How did they know? Well, when the Lord um, met with the disciples after the resurrection, he said to them, go and preach to all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe everything I commanded you. Well, have you ever thought about the fact that nobody ever wrote down what the Lord told them they're supposed to observe? Did you ever think about that? He says you have to teach or baptize them. It doesn't end there. Baptize them and then teach them to observe everything I commanded you. Well, where's that written down? How did the apostles know what to teach? You think they knew, or did Jesus say, hey, guys, you know, I told you a few things. You figure out the rest. Just figure out the rest on your own. He dropped down a Bible as he was ascending. Here you go, plop. Figure out it, uh, figure it all out for on your own. Of course not. They knew exactly what to teach. They knew ex because they had been shaped by the Lord. They had lived with him for three years, day and night, they didn't leave his side. You know, I'll take a little detour here. People have asked me so many times about The Chosen. Do I watch it? What do I think about it? And I wasn't watching it because it moves very slowly. And I decided I just, I just didn't have the patience for this. But so many people asked me about it. I said, okay. I said to Father Corsa, we have to watch some episodes of this, okay. So I haven't watched a lot of it, but I'll tell you, uh, first of all, it's kind of like the apostolic soap opera, if you ask me. <laughs> I'm sorry to put it that way, but here's why. I watched about three, three episodes, and part of it is like the love life of the disciples. You know, these guys getting married, Thomas met this girl, he wants to propose to her. I'm like, this was not happening. I'm pretty confident about that. Okay, they didn't have time. Jesus let them, Jesus let them go, and then they all were looking for a place. Some of them had no place to go. No place. Somebody said, oh, you can come and stay with me to one of the apostles. I have a spare room. Like People usually didn't have spare rooms, by the way. Everybody was in one room. But I mean, this whole idea that people were, had free time, and Jesus went home, and then they were, you know, I don't know, looking for a place to spend the night? This, is just, this was just kind of weird. But I'm telling you, they, they were with him day and night. And they also meant, oh, this is something else. They, were, they showed this kind of shanty town that was growing in Capernaum from all the crowds that were coming to see Jesus. And like it was a homeless kind of encampment, and the Romans were getting upset. First of all, the Romans were not in Galilee. Okay, that's the one first really huge mistake. The Romans were not ruling Galilee. Herod was. And we know about the centurion, but he was most likely um, somebody who was simply a mercenary working for Herod. Okay, so the Romans were not, the Romans weren't care, care, concerned about the crowd control or the fact that the, the tents were too close to the flames and all this other stuff. That's all invented, and, and I get it. But what I, I want you to think about what, how they really live. Don't let, if you like that show, I don't think there's anything horrible about it, but if you like that show, it's putting an idea of, in your head about what life was like between Christ and the apostles. They did not leave his side. Even when he said, get in the boat, go on the other side of the lake. They didn't want to go. 
It says he compelled them to get in the boat and go, I'm telling you, get in the boat and go to the others. They didn't want to leave him. That's the truth. Would you, would you leave him to go, you know, um, wooing a girl or something like that? I mean, it's, it's, it's very, it's very worldly. It presents the apostles in a very worldly sense. Now, we know that they weren't perfect. They made a lot of mistakes. They didn't understand the Lord. But there's no, they, they left everything. And this is what the scriptures say. We left everything to follow you. That's how they lived. They left everything behind for him. So as they were with him day and night, they saw how he spoke to people. They saw how he healed people. They saw how he interacted with the scribes and the Pharisees. They saw all of this. And he praised them when they did the right thing. He rebukes them when they did the wrong thing. And they learned his phronima, his thinking. And he it was instructing them. They listened to him while he was instructing all these crowds. And he also took them away privately and was teaching them off by themselves, right? The scriptures say that. By the way, that's not written down either. What did he teach them privately? That's not written down anywhere. So you see, they were shaped by the Lord. So when he said, now go and preach to all the nations, they knew exactly what to teach. And they knew exactly how to behave. And this is what they instilled on those first Believers, this is how people learned to be a Christian, by modeling the apostles who modeled the Lord. And that's not written down anywhere. This is something that was passed on orally, because the Lord taught orally. This is not tradition of man, this is tradition of the Lord, who is God, by the way. Now, there's a real popular idea today that the apostles taught different things that, you know, they couldn't have all taught the same thing. They all had their own ideas, and they will say, well, Paul's theology is different from John's, and John's theology is different from Luke. And this is not true. This is a lot of nonsense. They did not teach different things. They were all shaped by the Lord, okay? They learned from him, and the reason why people today will say the apostles, now, why, do they, why are they trying to say that the apostles taught different things? That there wasn't one consistent church, why? Because they want to have an excuse for their own diversity of opinion. Oh, your opinion is this? Okay, that's fine. Well, that's your truth, as if there is such a thing as an individual truth. That's what people are using to excuse diverse opinions. So they said there's not one Christianity, but many Christianities. Well, we know one thing. There were many heresies. There was one church, and that church was Orthodox. There was orthodoxy, and there was heresy. Heresy is the opposite of orthodoxy, okay? That's what existed. And we also know from the New Testament that they were united in their minds and in their teachings. And St. Paul said, this is, what you, this is what I taught you. This is what all the other apostles taught you. So we taught, and so you believed. That's what he said. It was the same. We don't have each individual apostle teaching something different. Does that even make sense to you? Just think about it. This is why I'm telling you, be careful about allowing these ideas about the apostles being just like everybody else, except that they follow Jesus, who's just another rabbi. Be careful that that doesn't infect your mind, because I want you to realize the fact that the apostles were shaped by the Lord, and he tr entrusted the church to them. And he knew that they would take care of the church. He knew that. And they all taught the same thing. There was a unity of faith within the early church. And why is this? Why are we confident about this? Besides the fact that we see it in the writings of the early church, we're confident that there was a unity of faith because today people say, well, yeah, but the apostles taught different things. You know why they say that? They say that because that's what they would do. Because today we would say, well, I don't agree with that. This is my idea. That's worldly thinking. That's what a lot of theologians say. You know, well, that's okay. That's the church has always taught this. But I'm going to teach something else. Because that makes sense to me. The apostles didn't think like this. That's the mind of the world. Okay? And they were not 
thinking with the mind of the world. They had the mind of Christ. They had a unity of the faith. And by the way, can you imagine any of the apostles, any of the apostles saying, because, because they knew very well what the Lord in, wanted them to convey when they went out to preach. They all knew what he wanted them to teach and how he wanted them to instruct the first believers to live. They knew it. Can you imagine any one of them saying, yeah, I know that's what Jesus said, but I have a better idea. Okay? I, I, I don't know. I'm not going to go along with that. I mean, honest to goodness, could this have ever happened? They knew he was the Son of God. The Son of God. You really think they're going to replace their own ideas with Jesus' ideas with their own? That's ridiculous. They were saints. And today we are not. And only a person who doesn't have the mentality of the apostles could ever imagine that they would substitute their own ideas for what Jesus Christ taught them, or kind of make it up as they went along. So you see, so the reason why people feel like they can is because so much of what the Lord said and did was never written down. Most of what he said and did was never written down. So how do we know what to believe? Well, that's why we call it apostolic tradition. The apostles preserved what the Lord taught. Now, where is that today? Where is that? That's kind of hard because we feel like somehow we should be able to point to it. It's, it's tradition. It's somewhere. Well, where do we find this thing we call tradition? It's very difficult because we can't point to it as being one thing or even one little practice we have. It's really the totality of the life in the church, and it expresses itself in tiny little subtle ways, but if you know what it is that this little action or this little prayer, this little thing that you do is, is trying to teach you, you will see the tradition behind it. But most of the time, we, we're just too dull. We're just too dull with it to see it, or we just don't know. So, I mean, we can't point to, oh, this was done by the, approved to me, by the way, here's something else. The press is saying, well, where is it written? What is the earliest written account of blah, blah, blah? Veneration of Mary, um, I don't know, prayers for the dead, whatever it is. Where is the earliest written account? Well, you cannot engage in that kind of a discussion on their terms, okay? Because ask them, just what I told you, when Jesus before, on the, on the mountain at the end of Matthew 28, it's called the Great Commission, you know this, Jesus said, teach them to observe everything I commanded. Where is it? Okay? So there was no early written proof of absolutely everything. The church didn't function that way. So we have to recognize this and be able to respond to this. Now, Every, early, every church claims to be the original church, the early church. They put the name apostolic, the word apostolic in their names, you know, African apostolic, and all kinds of different apostolic things. But they are not the early church. They're not the original church because especially the Protestant churches have broken off, right, from the Catholic faith. And even the Catholic, even though it has a direct connection to the early church, has changed so much that it does not begin to resemble at all the early church. It doesn't behave like the early church. They don't worship like the early church. They don't have their structure of the early church. But today, people are recognizing that something's missing. And this is why a lot of you found orthodoxy or you're considering orthodoxy. People are trying to recreate the early church because they recognize the shallowness, the trendiness, the emptiness of all of these other churches because there's something missing spiritually. There's, there's no real connection with Christ, except on maybe on an emotional level, which is what the Protestants try to bring out, this emotional connection. So everybody's trying to recreate the early church. And there have been, of course, this is what Joseph Smith did. He said the church was missing for hundreds of years until it was rediscovered you know, by, by Joseph Smith and the golden plates and, and all of that. And Ellen White, the Seventh-day Adventist, she, this is the early church, and they keep some of the laws of Moses, and they worship on, on Saturdays. They're trying to recreate the church. Those are you know, 19th century American religions. Nowadays, people are forming little house churches. Well, we see in Acts that people met in houses, so we'll just meet in our houses. 
the Hebrew Roots Movement, Messianic Jewish congregations, people who are not Jewish, have never been Jewish, are joining Messianic Jewish congregations. Those are Jews who believe in Jesus, okay? Called Messianic Jewish. Now, this whole thing with the chosen, it's inspiring people to try to readopt Jewish practices. You know how wrong that is? Do you know how wrong that is? That's like blasphemy. To go back and have a Passover Seder? Why would you do that? Okay? We dropped the law for a reason, because Christ is the fulfillment of the law. When we go to worship on Saturday, because that's what the Jews used to do, do and Jesus was a Jew, and we're going to worship and celebrate a Passover Seder meal, what did Jesus say? What did Jesus say at the Last Supper? He said, do this in remembrance of me. No longer are you going to remember Moses, but me. This is the new Passover. That's why we say the new Passover. Keni Pascha. Pascha Kenon. Right? This is the new Passover. This means it's a victory of Christ. Why would we ever want to go backwards? Can you see how faulty the reasoning is? But you can't blame people for trying to find the early church. That's why I'm telling you. Let them know who we are so that they don't get lost chasing all these rabbits, you know, these Easter bunnies as they go running off and jumping and leaping. You know how the bunnies love to jump and leap and then go, go into the holes. People are looking for something that's missing. And we have it, okay? The Protestants are not happy with their churches. They don't have to change it. They just start a new church, right? Or they find something else that pleases them. They, they follow a personality, Joel Osteen, Billy Graham, Joyce Meyer, John MacArthur. These are personalities. So what, what happens when they're dead? What happens to that ministry? It's over. It's as dead as they are. Robert Schuller, do you remember him? Those of you who are old enough to remember? 1980s, we had a parish in Camarillo, California, and our parishioners would watch Robert Schuller. It was called the Hour of Power for you young folks. He built a church all of glass called the Crystal Cathedral. He was a televangelist, but he was like one of these popular thinking kind of Joel Olsen along those lines, not John MacArthur. Like, everything's great. God loves you. God wants to bless you. You're going to be prosperous and everything. And he made millions. And our parishioners would watch him, and then they come to church. And they'd say to Father Costa, Father, we want to come to church and feel good. Robert Schuller is out making us feel good. That's not why we come to church, okay? We don't come to church to feel bad, but we don't come to church to feel good. We come to church, first of all, to worship God, and secondly, try to improve ourselves spiritually. Not to listen to this drivel that we're all great, God loves us, we have nothing to do. This is the problem in the Protestant parishes. They're all saved. They've got nothing to do. That's the truth, and that's why they feel, they, except for wait for Jesus to come back, right? That's why they sense that there's something missing. We have that in our practices, in our daily practices, in our prayer life. We know how to come closer to the Lord, how to become humble, how to acquire virtues. That's what orthodoxy has. So the Protestants are following personalities. They're looking for some worship to kind of make them feel good, but they're constantly looking for the next thing. Catholics are constantly waiting for the next pope. That's the truth. So again, I'm not saying this to be offensive to anybody, but if you don't like the current pope, they pin all their hopes on the next pope. I can't tell you, I've been around Catholics since I was 15. I'm now 67. Okay, that's a lot of being around Catholics. And you know how many times I heard? Maybe the next pope will fill in the blank either return the church back to the way it used to be, or modernize it even further. Everybody wants something, okay? I haven't found a Catholic that really is happy with their church the way it is. They want to change something about it. The Orthodox Church couldn't be more different. We don't want to change the church. Isn't that strange? Even now, listen. Even though things happen that disappoint us, sometimes there are scandals, sometimes people disappoint us. They say things, they do things, but the problem is not the church. It's not the church that needs to change, it's we who need to change. That's why the church exists. 
to change us, not for us to change it. People who are trying to recreate the early church will never, ever succeed. They're combing over Acts, they're reading Paul's, they're looking for clues. This is what the early church was like. They're building this whole idea for the early church. They will always fail because, not only because most of the things of the early church were not written down, including a very important prayers. St. Basil the Great tells us that many things were never written down, even in his time, which is after the church was legalized, not just because things were written down, but because they don't have the phronima, the mind of the early church. So when they read the New Testament, they completely read it in a juridical, medieval manner. Protestants are children of the Catholic Church. And the Catholics also read it in this way through the lens of the Middle Ages and this kind of thinking. So, you know, what is it like to be a Protestant? Faith alone, Bible alone. What does it be to Catholic? Rome, stay with Rome, stay with Rome. What does it mean to be Orthodox? We preserve apostolic tradition. And that is our liturgy, our ascetic practices, our spiritual readings, our total way of life. And this is what gives us the unity of the faith. That's why we have to preserve it. The Protestants are not united. Forget about it. They'll never be united. They'll always break off. They'll always be a new group. Rome, at least, the Roman Catholics, got to hand it to them. They don't always like the Pope, but they stick with the Pope. They stay with Rome. They're united jurisdictionally. They're united administratively. They don't have unity of the faith. There are 1,000 different Catholic orders or brotherhoods and sisterhoods. Did you know that? You know what I mean? The Dominicans, the Franciscans, the Jesuits, the, the Sisters of Mercy, the Sisters of St. Joseph, the Sisters of the Sacred Heart, the Brothers of this, that, and the other, Brothers of Hope, all of it. There are 1,000 of them. Now, here's what you don't know about that. They're all different. They have a different lifestyle. They have their own founder. They read the prayers of the founder. They study the life of the founder. And they model themselves, not after Christ, but after the founder. They have different spiritualities. The Catholic Church is very fractured in their theology and in their spirituality. There isn't a consistent spirituality. We have one spirituality. We have one set of teachings, and we don't need an official catechism to know what the church teaches. We have unity of the faith, of the faith. Nobody else has that. That's why we have to preserve it. That's why we shouldn't follow human reasoning, and somebody comes along and says, yeah, we should do this. We should have this. We should have that, because that's the right thing to do. I really believe that we should have, you know, let's revive you know, women deacons or something like this. Why should we do that? Well, because we have to have, give women some role in the church. We have to modernize, right? I just want to remind you that everybody who ever lived believed themselves to be living in the modern era, and they were. Now, do you think the ancient Romans said, we're living in ancient Rome? <laughs> you actually, you see this kind of language in the fathers that the age has come. We're in the new age. We're in the modern age. That's what the Bible says again and again. Okay? Now seriously, think about this. Because if we're going to modernize to appeal to people today in this culture, the church will be constantly changing. And you're going to wake up one day and you're not going to recognize your church. That happened to a lot of Catholics. Let it not happen to us. Now, when an argument is is presented for changing, it's always presented in the classic Western manner. Two opposites. You're either for this or you're for that. Okay? It's either faith alone or faith and works. It's scripture alone or scripture and tradition. It's either you accept same-sex marriage or you hate homosexuals and you're saying they're all going to hell. Okay? They create these dichotomies that don't fit orthodoxy. Either you accept female deacons in the Orthodox Church, so we have not just revitalization of what it used to be, but a new form of female diaconate, which is what they're trying to do, or you are evil, patriarchal, and you think that women are inferior to men. Well, the, in Orthodoxy, it's never one of those. That, those categories come from Catholic thinking of the Middle Ages, and they were just adopted by Protestants. 
For us, the answer is never one of those two options. So the answer has to be something else. It's none of the above, okay? So we have to remember who we are, how we think, and be careful of the questions. Question the question. So if somebody says, I see this sometimes on Facebook or whatever, they say this, <laughs> it was one of the most recent ones, was, um, do I have to do good works to be saved? Why are you asking the question? Can you see that there's a problem with the question? The problem is the question. And if you answer it, yes, you're just as bad because you're, you're buying into the idea that this should even be the question. It is not the question. Okay? Uh, what does orthodoxy think? You know, do you see how they're trying to sort of put us with the Catholic Church? Well, we're not exactly, so we're kind of put in the, that category with the Protestants. You can't say, yes, you have to do a thing, because what about the thief on the cross? Right? So we don't answer those kinds of questions. Just try to correct the question. We don't think like that. We don't create rules. This is what you have to do to be saved. And if you check all the boxes, you're going to heaven. We don't even talk about going to heaven. We talk about salvation. What's wrong with the question? Do I have to do good deeds? And it's not the same as some Protestants will say, well, if you are saved, you will do good deeds. Well, obviously there's some truth to that. And there's even some truth to the idea that we need to do good deeds. But not to be saved. The point of doing good deeds is to be transformed toward being more Christ-like. Not that we have to do things to be saved. Can you see the difference? The difference is enormous. Absolutely enormous. So I'll tell you one more thing. I'll try to wrap up in a few minutes. So, <laughs> five minutes, five minutes. A year, about last year, I was invited to Wesley Seminary to talk about same-sex marriage. And I thought, why, why are you inviting me? I'm not an ethicist. Oh, we heard about you from so-and-so, so. Now, here's what's happening in the Methodist church. They've split, of course, of course. Because the United Methodist Church accepted same-sex marriage, and then uh, most of the Methodists were actually against it, but it got ramroded through, all right? So, so they split off, and they want to, they, the purpose of this meeting was to come up with arguments against same-sex marriage. And... Um, they, say, they said that this is the premise. If sexuality is dogma, it cannot be changed. That's what dogma is, you know, unchanging truth. If it is custom that men and only men and women get together, then it, it can be changed. So look at how they framed it. It's either dogma or it's custom. And so they wrote down in the program, Dr. Constantina will talk about why human sexuality is dogma from the orthodox perspective. I said to the guy before, I said, it's not dogma for us. But he didn't know what to do with that. Because he know it's not custom. Okay, but they didn't know what to do. But everybody else there was either Methodist, or there was one Catholic guy, one Lutheran guy, and me. Okay. So I spent the first half hour telling them what's wrong with the premise, okay? And this is how, now they loved it because the Methodists have a tradition of holiness and sanctification and many Protestant groups do, but they don't know what to do with that. They don't know how to actualize that. They don't know how, how to activate that. You know what I'm saying? Because here I'm talking about, it's, it's not about whether it's dogma or, or custom, it's about how we become sanctified. And this is that we're not, not by following our carnal instincts, regardless of what they are, even eating too many cookies, like which is my problem, okay? This is, this is the question. It's how, how we think about the problem. The problem here is that people are following their carnal desires. And by following their carnal desires, rather than trying to live a spiritual life, they're not able to be saved. It's not about, well, we, if we say this is okay, now this person can get into heaven, like they're crossing over the finish line. And they love that, but they don't know what to do with it because they have nothing in their church that helps them on this process of sanctification that we have. Do you see how blessed we are? 
And if that's what, the, that's what the apostles established, that's what John Wesley, the founder of Methodism, kind of got an inkling of what was there by reading the church fathers, but he wasn't part of the Orthodox Church. So he's, they frame it within a, ca, a Protestant context. They frame it as Protestants, and that's why they, it doesn't work for them. They know that's what they're supposed to do, but they have no idea how to do it. So we have to be willing to not follow the world and incur the hatred and animosity of people because Jesus told us the world will hate you because you're not of the world. The world loves its own. The church can never compromise and accept the thinking of the world. We should do this because, oh, it's a nice thing to do. We want to make people feel good. And this is what's happened. This is the human reasoning. So here's the problem. And we'll just give the same-sex marriage as an example. The traditionalists will say, you know, homosexual acts are a sin, so there can never be homosexual marriage. And this is in the Bible. There's nothing you can do about it. And then the other people over here, other Protestants are saying this. They're saying, you know, um, we want to affirm the goodness of every human being, that God loves every human being. Can't argue with that. And so they say, well, we're going to ignore what the Bible says, or we're going to say that it was not understood properly, or maybe people, we, we understand better now, they're born that way, or whatever you want to say. They're just going to ignore what the Bible says, and they're going to affirm this the firm people in sin, and by the way, it's not just same sex, but heterosexuals who are also rampantly sinning, right? So when we want to turn a blind eye to that. So you, can you see that? And so what the Orthodox Church says is neither of those, but they don't know how to bridge the gap. So the best the Protestants can say, or maybe even Catholics is, hate the sin, love the sinner, right? Now, how does that work for us? Of course we love the sinner, but that's, the, that's not a very orthodox response. And why not? Think of the prodigal, uh, of, not the prodigal, the publican and the Pharisee. Why do we hear that every single year? Because we are supposed to imagine ourselves as the Pharisee. So we don't say, hate the sin, love the sinner, because we're saying, we'll welcome you in the church even though you're a sinner. What we're saying is that we'll welcome you into the church because we're all sinners. Join the club. Join the club. That's your thing to struggle with. We can never say it's okay. There's nothing wrong with it. Just like we can never say about the man and the woman who are living together, not married. It's okay. Don't worry about it. Jesus loves you. We can never say to Presbyter Genie, it's okay that you're overweight and you're eating too many cookies or whatever it is because that's my carnality. That's my struggle to deal with. That's what I have to struggle with. And I'll probably be struggling for the rest of my life. We all have something. We're all sinners. That's what makes orthodoxy unique. Nobody is taking that approach with any of these religious questions. No one. That's why we have to be thinking differently, thinking orthodox, so that when we face these things, we say, now, is this, what would the orthodox response be to this? And try not to just adopt the Catholic response kind of by default, because this is what we're sort of tempted to do. So we cannot accept the world's values, even though the world is shouting at us. And by the way, there are a lot of people in the orthodox church who are trying to get us to listen to the world. But when the church begins to listen to the world, the church becomes corrupt, and the church cannot save the world. The church is the body of Christ. It's holy, and it's perfect. The church is here to tell the world how to live, not the world to tell the church how to change itself. So it is our responsibility to preserve the Orthodox faith, Regardless of the consequences, we may be disappointed sometimes by our parish priests, by our bishops, whatever. That makes no difference because our church doesn't stand or fall on one personality. As much as you love your priest, as good as he is, the church is going to be here when he's gone, when all of us are gone. The church, as long as we preserve it. So we have to preserve it regardless of the consequences, regardless if somebody says that you know, you're a hater or you're, uh, you, you know, you're, you're a patriarchal uh, misogynist 
or that you're, uh, you know, you're um, ho you know, homophobic, whatever people want to say, let them say it. We're here to preserve apostolic tradition because the church was preserved through all of these generations, not by the theologians, not by the priests or the bishops or whatever, by the ordinary people, you, you. All the little yayavas, the grandmas and the moms who sat their children down, taught them how to make the sign of the cross, taught them the prayers of the church during communism, during Muslim occupation, during Roman persecution. The church survived because of the ordinary believer who did this, preserved the faith and didn't allow anything to corrupt it. That's our calling. That's our challenge today. That's our responsibility. And let us follow through with that so that one day we will hear, well done, good and faithful servant, enter into the joy of your master. So with that, we'll stop. Okay. <clears throat> so, Father, um, it's a little bit late. I know some of you have two things to do. We've got to go home. We've got children and whatnot. Do you want me to take questions or comments? How about 10, ten minutes? Because we have, it's about 9.20 right now. Um, anybody have a comment or a question? Yes, go ahead. What happened to the lady? Oh, oh, yeah. What happened to the lady? My, my client. My client. Yeah, we revived the case. The judge allowed us to revive the case. And uh, she, went to, she went to arbitration because as a stockbroker, she had already signed an agreement to go to binding arbitration. So she got something, but, and she rebuilt her life. She did, but she was grateful. In the law, you can do a lot of harm or you can do a lot of good. You know, it, it should be a noble profession. It's not always, but yeah, I didn't think about that. Any, anything else? Yes, yes, question over here. Which one are you referring to? Oh, okay, crucifixion book. Oh, yeah, we could have some questions about that. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, this is a very good question. So the question is, he's referring to the book, The Crucifixion of the King of Glory, and it's giving a historical context. How do we do that? It's very difficult, okay? Yes, you know, of course. It's, it's, this is really the fruit of a lot of study and a lot of knowledge and knowing where to get the answers to things. That's why I presented it that way, because an ordinary person would never even know where, what books to find all these answers to these different questions. So when we're reading the Bible... The, first of all, the more we read it, the, more, the better we understand it. It's like anything else. This is my area of expertise. I'm not that smart. I'm really not. I just know more than you do, okay? <laughs> In this area. In this, about the Bible. About the Bible, Roman law, Roman law. Now, if you ask me... Yeah, I'm not that smart, I'm really not that smart. So I just know more about this little area. But if you ask me about something, one of you, something that you guys do for your profession, I wouldn't have a clue, right? Everybody's an expert in something. It just so happens that my area is this. So uh, you shouldn't feel like there's something wrong with you. You're never going to understand it at that level. But now, reading books like this helps you to understand it on that level. So what we do, I'm telling you what Chrysostom said. Chrysostom said, the Bible is written in a way that everyone can understand something of it. But the, the, if you really want to dig deeper, you have to learn how to mine for the gold. And that means you have to learn techniques and you have to read these kinds of books that tell you more about the background. So there are Bible, they call them handbooks, where you can read about life and times in Bible lands. But it doesn't happen without a lot of effort. So, you know, you have the fruit of years of study there in the book. So I wish I could, but that doesn't mean you shouldn't read your Bible just because you're not going to understand everything. Read and understand what you can and think about it. We're, we're never all going to be experts in the Bible. It's not easy. The Bible is not an easy thing. Uh, uh, uh. I, I don't think I'll live long enough for that. I'm going to do one, God willing, on the resurrection. 
that's going to be the follow-up to that book. And I hope maybe someday on the nativity. We'll see. But I've got a whole list of things I need to write on. But thank you so much. So just keep plugging away on it. If there's something you don't understand, you have a Bible study here, don't you, Father? Okay, come to Bible study. You know, ask, come to Bible study, ask your questions there. That's the way to do it. And if not, there are also other places where you can ask. Ask Father, but don't ask Father after church. You know, during the coffee hour. He's tired. Okay. <laughs> Who else had a hand up? Somebody else over here had a hand up. Yes, over here. Mm -hmm. Jesus, he says, at the end of my book, I said, Jesus didn't live with his little religion, but with the church. Well, as a Greek, you know, the Greeks, they almost never use the word Christianity. It's a very strange word. The Greeks always talk about the church. They don't say Christianismos. However, how often do you think? It's not a religion. It's a whole way of life. It's a relationship to God. That's what Christ left us. Not a set of beliefs that we follow that somehow we're going to find our way into heaven. Do you see what I mean? That's what I meant. Yeah. That, that's why I said there weren't many Christianities. There was one church, and there were heresies. Yes, absolutely. But there was just one church. Anybody else? Yes? Yeah. Is Pocatello going to be recorded? I don't know. I never ask them that. I just let people do what they want to do. So I'm sorry. But it's, there's lots of other, you know. That one is, I'm thinking Orthodox. Let's see. I spoke in, um, in Houston on their Unclean Monday. There's a recording of that on their website, the Houston Annunciation Church. I think also at, um, at the St. Anna's in uh, Flemington, New Jersey, I think they recorded that. So it's going to be very similar. It's never exactly the same, but it's going to be close enough. Um, anybody else? Yes. How many books have I what? Have I written? How many books have I written? Oh, only four. Only four. <laughs> I have a lot more up here, but it takes a long time. You know, writing a book is very hard work. It takes a lot of, for it to be a good book. Anybody can write a book. But a good book takes a lot of effort. What are you good at? Solving Rubik's Cube? Oh, you're, you're very, see, I couldn't do that. Here's a Rubik's Cube expert. You see, we all have our area of expertise. And that doesn't make somebody better than anybody else. Uh, you just you know, you know your area. So don't be discouraged if you read the Bible and you don't understand everything. First of all, stick with the Gospels. You understand that. You understand that. The epistles of Paul, the New Testament, you can read Book of Revelation, but don't expect to understand it, okay? That's going to be something else. Yes, last question over there. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yes, this, okay, the question is about justification through Jesus. He didn't need Jesus to be justifi to justify us. Okay, well, um, this is the main thing in the West. And I was going to be talking more about that tomorrow in, in Pocatello. The difference between the Western mind, the Western idea of salvation and the Eastern. So in the early church, they did not emphasize the cross of Christ. The emphasis was on the resurrection and our appropriation of what Christ did. Do we have the icon of the resurrection? Resurrection. Right here, the little one. You can't really see it very well. It's not a big one. But the, the resurrection is Christ conquering death and opening up to us the gates of paradise so that we can have eternal life with God. The difference between the West and the Orthodox is the concept of sin. And because the idea of sin is different, it's the idea of salvation. How is someone saved? So for the West, they made the salvation, they, they created an idea of sin. Sin is a crime or an offense against God for which someone has to pay. That was created 500 years before the Reformation. So by the time the Reformation came along, the Reformers just adopted that 
And they assume that that is true, but you don't see that in the early church. There are practically no sermons about the crucifixion. Do you know what the emphasis is? It's on the incarnation. It is God becoming a human being, and by joining those two natures in the one person of Jesus Christ, he sanctified human nature and made it possible for us to live with God. Heaven for us, we don't really talk about heaven, we talk about salvation. Salvation is eternal life in union with God. How do you accomplish that? God is holy. Our job on this earth is not to do certain things and check off these things, or like Catholics will have, you have to do this, you have to do that, you have to go to purgatory, nor like Protestants, Jesus did everything. Of course Jesus did everything. Jesus did everything. There's nothing we can add to what he did. But we're supposed to live lives of holiness so that when we die, we can have a relationship with God. But what's happening in our culture today is people are living very profane lives and they say, I'm a good person, I'll go to heaven. They're living a life of utter sin, and they're not, they're thinking about heaven as a place, like a park, like the Jehovah's Witnesses of the pictures of the people in the park. You know, it's a nice place to live, you know, you're sitting on the cloud playing a harp, I don't know. That's, that's, no, seriously, they don't think about what it is, but we know what it is. It's eternal life in union with God. That's why all, that's why all of those statements by St. Paul about sanctification, about being spiritual. That's what all of that means. But what happens is, because Protestants are reading the New Testament with this concept of Jesus paid for my sins, of a very transactional idea of salvation. Jesus paid, so there's nothing for me to do. it. And of course, most of that is because they're reacting against the Catholic Church. Well, the Catholic Church is the one that introduced this idea of justification, of, of somebody has to pay for the sins, and God sent the Father. So what does the Bible say about why God sent the Son to the earth? You know it. John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. The Protestant idea is that somebody had to pay. And sometimes it's worse, that the Father demanded that somebody pay, demanded the death of the Son. There's nothing further from the truth. So you see how it's skewed with this idea of a transaction. Somebody had to pay. Well, that notion of sin was very foreign to the early church. It's from the Middle Ages. Predestination, excuse me? Predestination will come to that? Well, uh, that's, that's, that's monstrous too. That's absolutely monstrous. You see, in th those scenarios, God becomes the problem. Jesus, w we have to appease God. Somebody had to pay. Thank you, Jesus, for doing this for us. You, you took care, you paid the bill for us. But in our understanding, we're the ones who need to change. It's not God that needs to be appeased by somebody having to meet certain standards of justice. This is very Catholic thinking. So Protestants are the children, the mental and inheritors, the theological heirs of the Catholic Church. And they cannot see out of that box. And kind of they don't want to, because it's easy. It would be great if we could say, just do this, 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 and you're saved, you don't have to worry about it. But we, it's not the truth. And that's not how the early church what the early church taught. It's always about this process of sanctification. But you know what? The great thing about it is there's a beautiful prayer, and I'm going to really end with this. There's a beautiful prayer on Holy Wednesday that Father reads during the Holy Unction service. And it says this, For you, O Lord, have said, As often as you fall, rise again, and you will be saved. That's what we do in the Orthodox Church. We constantly remember our sinfulness and we try and try and try. And as long as we're constantly trying to improve and acquire holiness, then that's, that's all we have to do. We don't have to meet any standard. You see what I mean? An artificial standard. You're welcome. I'm going to let everybody go. I know people have to leave, so let's go. If you have a question, you want to say something? You go ahead. What was it? Go, go ahead. Okay. Yeah, St. Paul said, I run the race. 
I haven't completed the race. Yes, absolutely. This is very true. That's how we look at it. So if you read the New Testament through the lens of this um, legalistic framework, and people say, well, Jesus... So is it, Jesus' death is a sacrifice, right? Jesus' death is a sacrifice. He paid the price. That's not what a sacrifice is. Everybody in here is either a parent or a child. You've had that relationship. You know that your parents sacrificed for you. You as a parent sacrificed for your child. Why? Because it was demanded? Because it was required? A sacrifice is an act of love. You see? So even there, when we hear the word justification, it sounds very legalistic. But in the word, in the Greek text, the word is dikiosini. It's righteousness. Jesus brought us righteousness, not justification, a legal status before God. But we have a different relationship with God. Okay, people, good night. Thank you so much for your attention. God bless. Okay. Thank you, Father.